Hello and thanks for joining me. Um, today I want to chat a bit about Pyotr Tchaikovsky. Um, I just recently finished this uh, Critical Lives biography by Philip Ross Bullock um, fairly recently, so I want to do a quick chat on the biography and then following that I will touch on what I'm reading and then if you've seen my last few videos you've seen that you know, I'm reading off my list, so I'm letting the universe choose my next book randomly in a drawing. So I will have my drawing for my next book um, coming up at the end of the chat. But yeah, all right, so Piotr Tchaikovsky, um, Critical Lives Biography. This was published in 2016. Like I mentioned, it's by Philip Ross Bullock. Um, this was published by, Re I wrote it down, Reaction Books. Um, and it's spelled cleverly, REAK with, with a K, R-E-A-K, Shun Books. And I'll put the link to their to this publisher below because I think this series is so cool. Um, it's called the Critical Lives series. And just um, here it says, um, titles in the series Critical Lives present the work of leading cultural figures of the modern period. Each book explores the life of the artist, writer, philosopher, or architect in question and relates it to their major works. And you're not going to be able to see this, but you can kind of tell there that these are all two columns of people who are included in this series. And then we have a, another page here. You can tell a little bit about it. Um, figures, really diverse figures from literary, art, uh, music, uh, philosophy, uh, we have Jean-Paul Sartre, Eric Satie, Schopenhauer, uh, Pablo Neruda, Georgia O'Keeffe, Karl Marx, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Lennon, um, just a wide variety, John Cage, Albert Camus, Fidel Castro, Paul Cezanne. Um, so this seems like a really cool um, series, Critical Live series by Reaction Books, which is a British so I was really, um, really pleased with the biography. I chose, you know, I didn't have a biography um, on my, in my want to read list, my sort of my master list of books that I have collected that I want to read. So, you know, um, at the end of last year, when I was putting together and curating my 2017 must read list, I really wanted to have a biography because one of my themes for reading for 2017 was, you know, reading diversity and part of diversity for me went read, meant reading um, different types of books that I normally don't read and biography was one of them. And so when I went to, um, when I was curating that list, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even have a biography I have like 200 works on my want to read list, but I didn't have a biography. That's how much I typically have not read biographies. So I decided, you know, I started doing kind of a search for biographies and I, I really wanted to, um, to have a really, I, you know, I narrowed it down to having a figure from music, the music world, uh, an artist and, oh, I, at the time I had seen, um, Swan Lake, the ballet, um, I think I saw that in 2015 and, um, you know, I, I loved it and I, I started listening more to Tchaikovsky's ballets. It's really good reading music. Um, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty and The Nutcracker. The Nutcracker is not just for Christmas. It's, it's good music any day of the year. Um, anyway, I was really interested in his work and, um, I mean his music and, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, his operas, uh, Eugene Onyin, Onyid, I think it's Onyigin, uh, Onyigin, I've heard it pronounced multiple ways. Um, and so, you know, uh, and as well as his symphonies and his chamber works, he was just sort of a prolific artist. He was really kind of famous um, to me because um, I had read long ago that he had, um, I think, performed at the Carnegie Hall when it was being inaugurated uh, back in the 1880s. So, you know, I thought that was real cool. So I chose Tchaikovsky, and I, I wasn't sure what to expect from this sort of shorter um, work. 
um, because it really does focus really on the artist around his work. It does delve in some into his personal life, obviously, as well. Um, you know, it talks about Tchaikovsky. It uh, starts with him as a young boy. He starts piano lessons at like five. Um, but at 10, his father really wanted him to go into civil service. And so um, he was sent away to a boarding school for, uh, I think it's called something like the Imperial School of Jur Judas Jurisprudence or something. Um, it was where young men, boys really, went to be educated to enter the imperial Russian imperial ser civil service in the 19th century. And so he did do that. Uh, he did have an interest in music, though, always. Um, he did uh, finish there and take a job in the civil service. But he, in his early 20s, he started um, music lessons at a conservatory um, there in St. Petersburg. And um, then they were founding another uh, school called, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it, the St. Petersburg. He started out school in Russian, the Russian Musical Society. And then he uh, he was he went to um, school for the newly in the newly founded St. Petersburg Conservatory um, there in his early twenties, and then that's sort of when really you know it took off for him musically, and he did leave the civil service. And the book actually has some letters to his dad about you know him wanting to try his luck at music, you know. And I'm really aren't we all lucky that that he did? He left the civil service and um, pursued a career in music. Um, like I said, he was really prolific. He had this early on in some of his letters. He talks about, maybe I'll be a success if I'm not lazy. Um, there's a quote from him that I really <laughs> kind of liked. It was, inspiration is a guest that does not willingly visit the lazy. <laughs> so this biography really explores, really puts him, uh, and connects him with his work that we know, his music that we know. Um, one thing really interesting to me, though, coming out of the book um, was his relationship with um, Mrs. Von Necht. Uh, let's see, her first name is Nadezka, Nadezda Von Meck, and she was a wealthy patroness um, in, um, I believe, she, well, she lived all over. Um, but she had a stipulation that, you know, she would support him financially so that he could devote his energy and time um, to music because he was, at this point, giving classes, I think, at, at a conservatory in Moscow, uh, and still composing, though, and so she really freed up a lot of his time by subsidizing him, but she had a stipulation that they would never meet, and they never did, So they, can, they but they carried on this really intense correspondence that we really get, uh, you know, a really glimpse of, um, of Tchaikovsky, of a different Tchaikovsky when he's communicating with her, because, um, you know, he, he shares, he's, she's an unknown to him, so I think maybe in his letters to her, he's He's more open sometimes about his music. Um, his letters to his brother Modest and his other brother Ana Ana Anatoly um, are also pretty, um, you know, revealing. Also about his personal life, you know, he was a homosexual um, in the 19th century. And so this, um, I, you know, I, I really thought this was really interesting because this was before the idea of homosexuality homosexuals existed. You know, I've looked it up and and the word heterosexual um, did not come, I guess I didn't write it down, but heterosexual I think didn't even become a term until the 20th century. So the idea of differentiating people into homosexual and heterosexual was not really an idea that was in people's consciousness, I don't think. Um, there were, um, you know, it was a, a thing that was, um, homosexuality was a thing that was sort of criminalized. But, um, you know, I think the interesting, uh, one, one takeaway I have from this book is just the history of what, you know, identity, sexual identity and, the, and sexuality um, and how that, what that history is. I'm sure there's been histories written on that. So that would be kind of interesting to learn because, um, you know, I think it's interesting, like for Freud, for example, there was no real idea of the subconscious before Freud. So people in the 19th century before Freud really didn't have an idea that we do today. We sort of take for granted of the subconscious and they wouldn't have had that idea just like they wouldn't have had the idea of homosexuality. You know, and Tchaikovsky did want to get married. He did get married uh, because he felt like he needed to because this is a social sort of a stability thing. It wasn't, uh, he did warn the bride though that uh, he was only looking for a brotherly, um, being a brother, having a brotherly relationship with her. Um, but nevertheless, he did suffer. Um, he did leave her after a few short weeks and 
had basically a mental breakdown from that. This book doesn't go into all of that quite so much. It does touch on it because it affects his music, of course. Um, and there's an awesome quote that I'm gonna um, I'm gonna close the chat with here in a bit, um, reading about what his his views on music were. Um, but um, you know, another interesting thing that I took away from the biography was how itinerant he was. He was rather old. I think it was the 1880s, and he writes a letter to his brother Modest, whose name was Modest, saying, you know, like, where's my home going to be? Because he traveled a lot through Europe and the U.S., actually. Um, you know, uh, was beyond for months and months. And then when he was back in Russia, he typically stayed with other people, either relatives, his sister, or others. And so... Um, you know, I thought that was that was kind of interesting because by by the 1880s he was already a you know middle-agedish man uh, at that at that point. So yeah, some um, some pleasures, some new. Uh, the thing about this book, another thing about this book, uh, which I'll show you real quick, it has a good bibliography, but it also has a discography at the end, um, which I think is cool. Um, if I can get that page open for me here. Um, yeah, so it has the operas, um, Cherevichki, which is also called the Tsarina Slippers, um, Eugene, Eugene Onegin, like I said. Um, then and they give some, some recommended recordings, which surprisingly I've heard some of them. Iolanta, another uh, opera, The Maid of Orleans, another opera. Mazeppa, another opera, and then the Queen of Spades opera. I've never seen this, but I've been listening to the music, and I love the music. The ballets, of course, The Sleeping Beauty, Swan Lake, and Nutcracker are all awesome. He had six symphonies. He died a few, like a week or two after the, the sixth symphony, his sixth symphony debuted. And then he had a number of chamber works and, and concertos and songs and just a, a really a prolific output. Um, one other thing that I've listened to now that I really love is the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which is an Eastern Orthodox liturgy that he wrote. Um, St. John Chrysostom, I, and I really like that. I love sacred music. This is kind of a choral thing. Um, yeah, so let me get to the quote because I'm going to run out of time, um, and then we will close with the quote. He says, this is from a letter, I have lovingly made repeated attempts to express express through music both the torment and bliss of love. I do not know whether I have succeeded, or rather I leave it to others to judge. I cannot agree with you at all that music cannot convey the all-embracing characteristics of love as an emotion. I am of the complete opposite view, believing that music alone is capable of achieving this. You say that words are required here. Not at all. It is precisely words that are not required. And where they are powerless, a more eloquent language appears in all its armor. That is music. I thought that was really beautiful and cool from the composer. Music is a language of its own and no need for words when it comes to the music. So, all right. Well, I'm going to close uh, the chat with that. I'm just going to touch real quickly on what I'm currently reading. Let me pull up the cover for you. Um, get the my library open. All right. So I am reading um, The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. This is a new translation uh, by Sheila Fisher. Um, there it is. And I'm sort of side reading. This is a modern uh, English trans translation, and I'm sort of side reading um, the original Middle English uh, just a along the way. But this is a, a really good translation that has the rhythms. This book is making me want to talk in rhythm, pentameter, iambic. Um, so yeah, um, it's been a lot of fun, uh, you know, to catch that groove, to catch that rhythm of the the iambic uh, meter that the the, the book has. Um, so I'm about forty per thirty five or forty percent through. I'm almost done with the Miller's Tale. Um, so I love it. You know, it's I'll have more about it later because I um, I'm carrying on a thread from last year when I sort of read a mini biography of Chaucer. It sort of got me back interested in the Canterbury Tales. So let's do my drawing for my next work here. I have seven works to go. Oh, I'm going to just use the one that flew out. Um, so let's see what we got. Stars Between the Sun and the Moon. Oh, wow. All right. So this has been actually Stars Between the Sun and the Moon. This is One Woman's Life in North Korea and Escape to Freedom. 
by Lucia Jang and Susan McClellan. Um, I heard about this book from um, the Bree Hill channel, Bree Hill's channel, and uh, last year. And this has been on my li reading list ever since, and I've never gotten around to it. So this is a, a memoir uh, of a woman who uh, escaped from North Korea. I know virtually nothing about North Korea, so I am looking forward to getting this memoir finally read. So that will be coming up after I finish the Canterbury Tales. I will close with that, and um, until next time, take care.